one of the things that I find kind of interesting about the, the EV world at the moment, um, we can specifically talk passenger cars first and then maybe then move on to commercial, but it's just the, the plethora of different platforms that are out there. So, you know, on the face of it, everyone seems to have kind of landed on that sort of skateboard design, I guess, where, you know, you've got a low slung battery that's sometimes, you know, part of the structure. Um, and then obviously you've got various motor configurations anywhere between one and four, right? But then beyond that, um, and specific to the lubricants, uh, things don't seem to be baked. So my understanding, for example, that the Nissan Leaf, I don't know about the second gen one, but the first one was, was just purely air cooled as far as the battery goes. And then we had, you know, you sort of move on to the Teslas, which are more traditionally like water glycol cooled. Um, and then the Porsche Taycan was sort of the first one that really tried to do that huge integration where it was single fluid kind of, you know, moving, uh, heat around, um, maybe where, where do you see, do you see it going? Do you, do you see that fractionation for want of a better word, uh, being permanent, or do you think that everyone is eventually going to land on a, on a most efficient platform? Yeah. Interesting question. I, I mean, certainly that trend between um, direct cooled e-motors um, or from going from dry to wet, um, I think is, is significant in the industry. Um, and a lot of the first generation ones were uh, dry, like the Nissan Leaf, where there's no direct lubricant on the electric motor. Um, but there's quite a significant number now which are moving to uh, direct cooled. So the Teslas, I think, are direct cooled. Uh, they use the same oil in the gearboxes to cool the electric motor. Um, and, uh, that's increasingly the trend that we see. Um, we did some work, uh, modeling that with Ricardo, um, and from the models that they took and, and the particular, um, examples they had, if you took a, a conventional vehicle, which is dry system versus wet, um, you'd see somewhere between one and 3% efficiency gain, um, over, a, you know, in, in its drive cycle. And, and if you relate that back then to range in the battery or cost of the vehicle, given that's where the battery cost or the, where the cost of the vehicle comes from with the battery, that's really significant for uh, the OEMs trying to make those sales and to, to make money doing so. So, um, I think that means that, um, we'll definitely see a shift towards, um, wet e-motors and that's pretty much across the board, even for the smaller vehicles where maybe there's less of a gain. Um, but I think that'll come in, um, and, and indeed the work that we're doing with the manufacturers bears that out, that in many of the cases, their first generations might've been, um, a dry design and in terms of the lubricant, then, um, using a, a relatively simple gear oil, um, tailored for the job, but you know, relatively traditional, um, and now moving towards something that's designed for it an integrated system. Um, so that's when we're looking at the transmission and the, uh, the e-motor part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the, the challenges that are involved there, right? Because, um, and probably the obvious uh, question that people would be asking is like, hold up, we've been, we've been lubricating electric motors for an awfully long time. You know, what is unique about, uh, the EV application? And obviously the fact that it's the, uh, the transmission coupled with the electric motor, mostly in sharing a common lube oil system, um, you know, my, my basic understanding of it is that is a little bit challenging because a lot of the additives that we have typically used to protect gears, you start to think of your sort of anti-wear and EP style additives are incompatible with the, the basically the copper windings, uh, in the electric motor. Um, is that more or less the crux of it or does it kind of balloon beyond that? No, no, that, that's right. I mean, there are some new properties as well that we're thinking about, but if, if I take this back. One step to start for that question. Uh, so I, I got my start in this industry be, um, looking at uh, tractor lubricants, off-road stuff. And there you've got a common sump that does everything. You know, so it'll go into uh, the hydraulics and the transmission and uh, the wet brakes and everything else. Um, and that the, sort of the learning that comes out of that is formulating for one thing is easy, you know, or relatively. I'll, I'll do my hydraulic formulators a disservice here. <laughs> um, yeah, formulating for one system is easy. Um, it's when you've got more than one system combined together in one sum that you start to have to make trade-offs and decisions about uh, what you need to do. Um, so let's put that in the context of EV. 
the second part of what you said there is exactly right. It's, um, if you had just calling the electric motor, um, okay, there are some decisions you've got to make there and you can optimize for it, but that's relatively straightforward. If you had just the gears to protect, that's relatively straightforward, but it's when you combine them together, um, that you start to have to make decisions and compromises. Um, and so like almost anything else formulating an additive where it drives the technology, it is about balance and, um, balancing those performances. So, um, you're absolutely right that in terms of the components that we've used traditionally to protect gears, uh, they can be, uh, more aggressive to some of the materials, um, unless you carefully formulate or find alternative strategies for it. Um, but there are new considerations like, um, uh, that we haven't had to consider before in transmission fluids, uh, like electrical conductivity, which is mm -hmm. not something we've had to measure. Now, transformer fluids and other things, yes, there's, there's learning that you could take from that and, and apply, but it's, it's not being a consideration in that area. Um, and so some of the components that you might have used just might be higher in, um, conductivity. And so you've got to formulate in the right way. Um, the other one is, uh, around heat. So that's the other key challenge with this, that, um, the electric motor can be much hotter. So uh, as a spot temperature and also just a, uh, in terms of the thermal load through the system. Um, and so, um, cooling and, and having an active part of that system, uh, but then also managing to survive that environment as well, are, are things that the, the lubricant now needs to do. 